Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Lewis. I'm the director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization here at the Department of Health and Human Services. And a series, in one of a series of our small business training webinars, today I'm so excited that we have with us the SBA PCR that services the majority of HHS, Ms. Barbara Weaver. Barbara is going to share with us on what market research requirements that she needs or SBA needs that she represents them, as well as any new laws and regulations that impact the small business program. So I'm very excited. The, we have changed how you receive your certificates. At the end of this webinar, if you complete a brief survey, you will automatically be given access to your certificate so you can print those with your CLPs on it. We heard what you were saying, and we just want to thank everybody for the previous feedback that they have provided and let you know that we truly appreciate you joining us. And let me just now turn over to Barbara, and, and, and you can ask questions throughout, but we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So Barbara, let me just welcome you again. Okay. Welcome back to HHS, <laughs> Barbara. Good to be here. Absolutely. So I'll just turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. The last time I was here, I was quite the rookie PCR. I didn't know HHS very well, and um, I was just on a pretty steep learning curve. So a lot has changed since then. And one of the things, let me just say, one of the things is um, that I have uh, such respect for the work that you all do. And I know that we don't always you know agree immediately on things but uh, overall I know that your mission is critical I know how important you are to uh, this country and to the world and um, I think it's fascinating work and it's just uh, I'm glad to be a part of it so let's just go ahead and launch into our training for the day some of this will be uh, repetitive it's things that we've talked about before um, some of its new things um, and as Teresa said um, when you have questions, go ahead and uh, make note of them and we'll answer them at the end of this session. So um, I always like to start with our mission, SBA's mission. Um, I, I, I do a lot of teaching uh, back in my home state and uh, one of the things that I do is I use SBA's mission statement kind of as, as the good example about how to, to write one when I'm teaching small businesses how to do that for themselves. And I love it because uh, it, it encompasses such a big program and I've always appreciated that about SBA. I'm in my uh, 14th year with the agency uh, and I have loved every single one of those years. So let's, let me just uh, go over that with you. Our mission at SBA is to maintain and strengthen the economy by enabling the establishment and viability of small businesses. And one of the things that I did recently is I did a little research on um, why small businesses matter. You know, SBA kind of feeds us uh, great bullets on uh, why uh, small businesses are important to the nation. Um, they're very agile. They're usually cost effective. Um, they are very innovative. A lot of things like that. But one of the things that I came across was uh, the fact that, S that small businesses in this current environment are optimistic. And, uh, you, you know, that wasn't on any of the SBA bullets that I've been receiving. So that optimism manifests itself in new hires, uh, expenditure of, of capital funds, uh, building new markets, a lot of different things. So um, I, I consider it uh, kind of a privilege, if you will, to make sure that small businesses stay optimistic, uh, not only at this agency, but at all the others that I work with. So um, as uh, this is just going to give you a little bit of a picture about what that uh, effort might look like. I serve HHS as your procurement center representative, as Teresa told you. You have others um, 
that uh, also operate in, in very distinct areas. Um, but I, uh, I, I work with several of the uh, coaxes and uh, kind of get a good, good cross picture of, of what's going on here. So what I do, Azure PCR is review procurement actions over $150,000. And what I like to think I do is um, help you make decisions about whether something should be set aside for, uh, for small business in any of the subcategories of small business you see on this slide. I also, at the conclusion of your efforts, review subcontracting plans before you incorporate them into a contract and make sure that we're tracking on goals and that we really have a good, a good contractual instrument for you to help manage that contract. Um, I, I do some tasks as a commercial market representative, but that has been getting to be smaller and smaller. Uh, you have two commercial market reps that operate in this DC area, uh, and I don't, I'm really not sure how many are across the nation. Uh, we all, but what they do is monitor the work of large uh, federal prime contractors to make sure that they are giving small businesses good opportunities as well. Uh, we also have one size specialist that operates in this area. He actually is out of uh, the King of Prussia SBA office. He's a great, uh, a great representative. He really knows it. That's a very complicated area because of affiliation joint ventures, mentor-protege, all of those kinds of things. And I'm, uh, we're very fortunate to have a good size specialist. We have a brand new COC specialist that has taken over some of those responsibilities. And we did some cross-training last year, and I got to do some, uh, perform actually some COCs. So I've added some slides to just kind of beef up that section of the, uh, of the presentation, so you'll have a little bit better handle on that. Okay, for today's training, here's what uh, we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to just kind of generically look at socioeconomic programs. Market research is going to, it's always a big area, it still is, it's probably always going to be, although I will tell you that we're seeing some great, um, actually some great progress in that area. Uh, subcontracting requirements, I'm going to try to flesh that out a little bit for you. Uh, limitations on subcontracting, we always talk about that because agencies are still getting their arms around it and we just want to make sure that you have got that, the COC that we talked about earlier, and then just a, kind of a catch-all uh, area uh, that we're going to talk about. Okay, so starting with socioeconomic um, uh, programs, uh, just, and, and I like to start here, um, what FAR 19.201 says is that small businesses should have the maximum practicable opportunities in the uh, primary uh, government arena and that they should also have it in the subcontracting arena. Maximum practicable opportunities. So it's our job, I think, um, as contracting professionals to, to figure out um, what that means, how, how we can make sure that small businesses um, are well represented in your programs and uh, that they are progressing, if you will. Um, we look at small business set-asides um, and as, as most of you know, we start with uh, looking at the NAICS codes and the size standards that go along with that and then making decisions about whether something should be a total set-aside, a partial, um, and uh, you are familiar with both. Usually we deal with totals, but we've, we have had some partial small business set-asides here. And the unilateral or joint just means uh, if, if you decide yourself within the agency that something's going to be set aside for a small business, then that, that is unilateral. If you and I work together, then we're looking at a joint uh, set-aside. Uh, of course, uh, under the rule of two, what we're looking for is two or more small businesses that are actually qualified to do the work. Um, what uh, FAR 19.502 says that the contracting officer will set aside an ac acquisition when it's determined to be in the interest of maintaining or mobilizing the, the nation's uh, full uh, productive capacity and to assure that a fair proportion of government contracts in each industry uh, go to small businesses. 
Now, there's a, a couple of steps that we have to take uh, before we get to a small business set aside. And um, under FAR 19203, uh, one of the things that you have to do as a, as a contracting professional is make decisions about whether perhaps something would fit better under a hub zone, a, an 8A service disabled vet, or a woman owned business category. Now those are the four categories that have, um, have um, a, a greater uh, importance, if you will, to the, in the set aside arena uh, before you actually consider just a generic small business set aside. And the interesting thing is, there, one doesn't have uh, more power than another. That's why I like to depict it on this line. They are equal, they are on parity with each other, and you, the contracting officer, have the responsibility to, de to determine or to select whether something should be, for instance, set aside for women-owned small businesses. And that is going to depend on the results of the market research, and we're going to talk about those, that more later. Oh, we're going to talk about it right now. Okay, there's these three sections of the Federal Acquisition Regulations that talk about the requirements for market research. And I think everybody has bought into that. You understand the importance of it. It really is a baseline document for making decisions about things like this. Um, so I, I, as far as I can see, everybody is doing it. You are complying with all of these shalls. You shall conduct market research, it shall be appropriate, um, and so on. Now, the interesting thing about market research, and I've, I have uh, conducted a lot of sessions in market research, and I've attended a lot, um, because I wanted to get my, I wanted to deepen my understanding about what this was and how we needed to do it. And there's actually, if you think about it, there's two different sides to the market research uh, uh, puzzle. First of all, there is what I call the strategic piece, and uh, that is kind of innate in everything you do. Those of you who are supporting uh, research that involves the need for microscopes, you already know who are the primary microscope um, producers in, in this country and around the world. So you kind of have a sense, you know strategically uh, who you need to be going to for something. Now, and, and some of that is open and shut, and over the past year I've come to understand how you operate here, and so um, I, I get it. I get who the best uh, microscope manufacturers are. Uh, but then, when it comes to an instant procurement, it's not always that clear. Uh, let's uh, say you're looking for um, a general services, you're looking for IT services, uh, then the market expands a bit, and you get to look at a larger universe of uh, possibilities. So in that case, that, that you're leaving the strategic arena and you're going to be focusing on a specific procurement action and drilling down into some market research is going to make sense. So the, the process or the, the whole uh, action for market research becomes this tool for contracting officers, small business specialists, and the PCR to determine who actually needs to be playing in this particular arena. Um, there also, um, and we can't, can't forget the history on the market research requirement, it uh, goes back to when we were becoming a government that embraced commercial items, and so that's really where market research started, and we came to realize over time that the small business part of it was, it was something that we could add on to that, and it would make actually make the whole process make better sense. And we also use it for making decisions about bundling and consolidation. Um, it is important to uh, making sure that small businesses can be uh, can participate in the federal market. And the time to do market research, of course strategic research you're doing on an ongoing progressive basis, but the specific market research is done bef uh, before or as you're developing new contract requirements. So it's very timely. Uh, it, it, it's impossible to put this kind of information up on a shelf 
and, um, and keep using it over and over. And we kind of use a 12 month limitation on information. And even then with uh, the way the markets are going, I like to see some freshening up of kind of old market research that you might be reusing. Um, Market research supports the, um, the acquisition planning. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I do think you do a good job on here is the acquisition planning. Um, many of you go into great detail and that information helps me, especially if I'm on the fence about something. Uh, I'm not just looking at market research and the justifications, but I'm going back actually to the acquisition plan and trying to figure out um, you know, what the whole picture looks like. And these are some of the, the things that you address in there. And you have a great format here for that. So I, th that's a valuable instrument for me. Now, one of the things that I sometimes wish in a, in a perfect world, um, I sometimes wish that uh, market research could just be, you know, it would just exist in this wonderful little uh, one comprehensive document and it would say everything. And some of you actually have taken it to the point where that's happening. You, uh, in fact, most of you, not everybody, but um, I, I know we're gonna keep on working on that. And, and actually, the reason that I like to see one comprehensive document is I can conduct reviews faster. And I'm doing about a thousand reviews a year. So uh, speed and accuracy are very important. So the more, the the clearer you can make that information for me, uh, the faster I can move, the faster you can get things on the street, and uh, the better overall programs that we have. So that's my little pitch for a one comprehensive document. Uh, as you can see, it's got a, a full array of uh, topics, and um, most of you are addressing those. Um, my boss at SBA uh, likes to use FPDSNG for market research. Uh, he finds it to be a valuable tool for just researching and seeing what the government's buying, how, what they're buying, who, how much, and all of that stuff. I have many small businesses that have really gotten into this and they're using it as a strategic tool for their planning process. So. Um, I invite you, if you aren't already looking at that, to add that to um, information that you might be using to uh, help you make decisions about things. Uh, FPDS has a, a good uh, set of information on contract history, allows you to look back and see um, how, how your agency and how other agencies have been uh, doing with certain procurement buys. So that brings us to subcontracting, and this is a pretty involved uh, topic. I, I get involved from a couple of standpoints. First of all, um, I, I check the uh, information in SBRS to make sure that you are considering a subcontracting plan if it's over the threshold. And um, secondly, I actually review the plans. and. Um, I'd like to congratulate you because the plans have come a long way. You know, you have agency goals, very specific agency goals for subcontracting, and that's the I, I, what I consider to be the baseline, where, where we need to be starting on those subcontracting plans. And then if you have something that is so complex, so difficult, um, that it, 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 small business can't be integrated, then you need to tell the story in uh, the subcontracting plan itself or in uh, ancillary documents that kind of uh, justify um, why you cannot reach the minimum agency goals for subcontracting plans. And let me just say that um, there's a rumor afoot that I never review uh, that I never approve anything below the agency minimum goals. And in fact, I have done that. But uh, in cases where um, the contracting offices have been able to tell me that and explain so I can understand why uh, small business can't be integrated into a particular area. Now, I know also that uh, universities are difficult. 
I, I deal with them also as a, a commercial market rep representative, and I will tell you that the education portion of, of, of my interaction with that um, segment of other than small business uh, is intense because most universities aren't up to, they aren't up on the step about subcontracting plans. Um, and they feel like it doesn't, maybe it doesn't really even apply to them. But in fact, it does. And I'm working on uh, a couple of universities specifically uh, to help integrate small businesses in with them just so they get it, you know, just so they understand when they do a subcontracting plan, there's a real intent. And they, just as a segment of the economy that par is participating in federal contracting, have a responsibility to. Uh, provide small businesses with maximum practicable opportunity, just like the you do at the agency level. So subcontracting, simply stated, is, is the process of putting in place a sub-instrument, if you will, under a federal prime contract. Uh, it includes any, any kind of service or supply. Uh, and it can be because the contractor doesn't want to supply it or can't supply it. Uh, we don't really care about that. Uh, it, in, it does include purchase orders and any changes or modifications to purchase orders. And the prime is responsible for its subs, including making sure that they take care of uh, flow down reporting. And the contracting officer is responsible for making sure that the prime is doing what they're, they're supposed to do. Now there's some exceptions that we're going to talk about near the end of this presentation that you need to be aware of, but that's generally the way um, the subcontracting process works. Now the JOBS Act of 2010 uh, really uh, roiled the waters a bit, if you will, about especially in the, the uh, subcontracting plan arena, small business subcontracting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This plan uh, came into being in September of 2010, and essentially what it did is it requires a higher level of accountability uh, uh, by large federal prime contractors in the small business subcontracting arena. Now uh, we're going to talk later about some changes that are happening. There's some big threshold changes that are afoot, and one of those is uh, in the uh, subcontracting plan, plan arena effective 10-1 that threshold minimum threshold is going to 700,000 now until then we're going to we're going to continue to uh, award plans at the $650,000 level but just know that this is happening I'm sorry um, could you get me some water thank you Okay, other uh, Jobs Act changes. We saw a lot of action around Section 1321, uh, and that re overall required uh, the government to step. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> to establish policy on small business subcontracting compliance. So that just meant that we were going to start looking at how prime contractors were doing. Um, and the assignment, the responsibility, uh, fell between the contracting and program offices and the Small Business Administration. Um, and what, what we do as an agency, what SBA does as an agency, is provide periodic oversight and review activities, and we trust that you are also doing the same, just as you would manage any other aspect of the contract. Other Jobs Act changes. Um, I, I think that Tightening the screws might be a, a bad um, analogy, but that essentially is what is going on with the, the changes in subcontracting um, with this JOBS Act. And, and what the, the government is trying to do with the changes in this act is make large prime contractors accountable for the plans and the goals that they put in place. So now if they aren't meeting those goals, then uh, and are are not making a good faith effort to meet them, 
then there it has to be some accountability. So we're at, oh, thank you so much. Just in the nick of time. <clears throat> so contracting officers are checking with primes to see how that's going. So there's a, a higher level of oversight, if you will. And um, one of the things that this Section 1321 uh, did is make sure that a failure to provide a good faith effort could result in assessment of liquidated damages. So and it's, to my knowledge, that hasn't been done yet. Um, in most cases, you're finding that <clears throat> prime contractors are in fact uh, making the effort and you haven't seen fit to assess liquidated damages. Uh, there's also a responsibility um, paying small businesses um, within 90 days, and that's something that contracting officers should be mo monitoring. And um, it gets to be, this is a, a serious matter, and it, it gets to be part of the evaluation at the conclusion, I'm sorry, at the conclusion of um, the contract it gets to be one of the things that you evaluate them on. <clears throat> so, a small business subcontracting plan is a formal plan negotiated by the contracting officer. You all have that down pat. You have uh, all of the fields in place. You provide good templates to um, your offerors, and um, in almost every case, you've, you've done a lot of the uh, groundwork for them. Um, the small business subcontracting plan should be negotiated. After, eva after evaluation and just prior to award. So, in fact, it should be made uh, either incorporated by reference or actually made a part of the contract at contract award. The, the subcontracting plan is based on total dollars available for subcontracting. And I know that agencies sometimes get very involved in uh, helping uh, prime contractors decide how much is going to be available, and I don't know exactly if, if that's something that you participate in, but um, one of the things that I don't get involved in is evaluating the total dollars available for subcontracting. I think the small business specialists do and contracting officers do, but uh, as far as I know at this point in time, that's part of, of uh, your decision making. And as we already talked, as an agency, you have distinct goals for all small business categories uh, in the subcontracting arena, and um, you express those in the template, you express those to prime contractors, and I know that there's lots of opportunity for negotiation between the template and what an actual plan looks like. Now, compliance reviews are um, uh, handled by the government on a prime contract. Um, you have responsibility for looking at any cor corrective action plans to make sure that uh, a prime is uh, complying with the subcontracting plan. And you should also be asking the question, is the prime contractor also uh, doing lower level reviews on uh, subcontracting reports that their uh, subcontractors are doing? <clears throat> so at the end of the contract, the final evaluation by the government would look at the uh, what has actually been achieved relative to contract goals and um, uh, decisions would be made if uh, there was lack of good faith effort and there should be liquidated, liquidated damages assessed. And uh, then there's a documentation for the process and I, I really think that it's very effective to note this in the past performance information retrieval system uh, if a, a prime contractor wasn't able to meet those. Um, and, you know, as I said, the JOBS Act has kind of uh, changed the whole environment for how uh, things are happening 
uh, and kind of made it, uh, taken it out of the n nice to have to, uh, we really have to be serious about this. Now I wanted to just spend a little bit of time on small business participation plans uh, because sometimes, uh, sometimes people get the two mixed up and this is a, a little bit different animal. It is an evaluation provision that shows up in uh, unrestricted negotiated solicitation for best value. It has to be all of those and it requires all offerers, large and small businesses, to address <clears throat> how they're going to get work into the hands of small business. So remember this unrestricted negotiated solicitation for best value. Now as I said it applies to both large and small business. Uh, the small business participation plan comes in with the um, with the, the offer. Uh, it doesn't uh, apply, it's not a requirement under invitations for bids or negotiated procurements uh, uh, that are evaluated using LPTA, none of those just the, what we talked about earlier. Um, essentially, what this small business participation plan does is based on the total amount of the offer, not the amount that's expected to be subcontracted, but the total overall value of the contract, it's evaluated and scored on the, uh, what the highest dollar amount uh, will be that goes to small businesses. Um, small business offers can get credit for self-performance, so they need to count their own um, their own award portion in that. And um, if if after evaluation uh, the award goes to a large business, um, there what you have to do is make sure that there is um, synchronization between the subcontracting plan and uh, the small business participation plan and I know that is one thing that drives small business specialists crazy is uh, getting getting documents that really don't sync up um, but they that should be part of your review process. A subcontracting plan becomes as I said earlier a material part of the awarded contract but in the case of a small business participation plan, that isn't the case. It just goes into the file. If a successful offeror is a small business, um, it, as we said, it's just part of the offer, part of the contract file. And as you know, no subcontracting plan is required for small business. They only have to worry about the participation plan. <clears throat> so, one more reminder, if the solicitation was set aside for small businesses at any tier, there is no requirement to include the small business participation plan and the evaluation factor is not required. It's only on unrestricted, full and open solicitations. Now just a little bit on limitations on subcontracting, but I, I just came out of a, a um, surveillance review and I, I can tell you two, a couple years ago nobody had their arms around the limitations on subcontracting and there really wasn't um, <clears throat> no one was monitoring it if you will uh, but now uh, I'm, I have found uh, tremendous improvement so I, I hope that's happening here too. Um, under this uh, subcontracting uh, limitations on subcontracting plan requirement uh, what it does is sets up a minimum portion that has to be performed by small businesses uh, to keep it from to keep us out of the world of pass-through contracts, um, and just to make sure that small businesses, when when they're performing uh, <coughs> a contract, they're actually they're actually doing it. We want to have that uh, that assurance. Um, this is not a clause that's applicable to large businesses. Um, so that doesn't enter in there. We're only interested in what's happening with smalls. <clears throat> so the clause is required on everything over 150,000 um, in all contracts and solicitations um, for supplies, services, and construction if any portion is set aside for a small business. Um, and on multiple award at Matox when uh, terms require that work orders under certain dollar amounts be set aside for small business. So that's kind of the universe of, of what we're looking for. It becomes binding, that clause becomes binding with the submission of an offer or bid and the execution of the contract. 
So under that, let's say you have a service contract, the contractor has to agree to perform at least 50% 50, 50 of the cost of labor with their own employees. Um, if it's a manufacturing contract, the limitation is to perform at least 50% of the cost of manufacturing supplies, excluding cost of materials. It gets to sound a little bit like uh, monopoly, some of the rules of monopoly, but these are, you know, they're very serious levels that, um, that we think are important so that um, small businesses actually are um, participating in this market. Um, under construction pro projects, it's a little bit different because uh, the, the level is 15% of the cost of the contract for a general construction contractor, excluding cost of materials and equipment. So that's a low level, but that allows a, a small business to serve as the contractor and really be responsible for most of the, the subcontracting that goes on, retaining the responsibility for program management uh, in-house. Um, I, I wanted to get on into the specialty areas because it, the, here under construction the amount goes up to 25 percent because it's assumed that a, a specialty construction contractor would also be doing part more of the labor. For instance, if it's a an electrical job, then probably it's an electrical contractor that's participating, so the expectation is that they would be performing more of the work. And that's what these bullets all say. Um, again, limitations, of, limitations on subcontracting does not apply to unrestricted uh, procurement, neither does it apply to small businesses. Uh, when they are successful on an unrestricted procurement or to a large business. Um, uh, they can subcontract with no limitations, but, uh, but of course they're operating within the purview of their subcontracting plans. Okay, now just a little bit of information on Certificate of Competencies. Um, this this process kicks in when a uh, small business has, there's been a determination made that a small business lacks the responsibility to uh, perform a certain government contract. And it's just a little bit of a uh, check and balance to make sure that, um, that everything has been properly considered. Um, under the COC uh, process, um, the SBA comes in to review um, and review a responsibility or a non-responsibility determination and issue the COC. Um, this, the process though requires that a contracting officer sends the referral to SBA. Um, the COC process allows that small business um, just another shot at becoming a federal contractor um, in uh, 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 perhaps a little bit more objectivity. Um, it, it results in an actual written certificate that the small business uh, that says that a small business has the capability to perform on a specific government contract. So it's, it is contract specific. <clears throat> when a contracting officer does a, a determination of responsibility, um, they'll probably tap into one of these areas, capability, cap competency, capacity, any of those. So that any of these areas would be, are determined um, to be important in making a responsibility determination, even the limitation on subcontracting. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that's part of the um, kind of the sticky wicket, if you will, on that, on that particular clause, because if a, a small business proposes something that isn't within the, the limitations that we talked uh, about before, then there is a, a possibility that we're looking at a non-responsibility. So the referral, which comes from the contracting officer, includes a bunch of information. So it's, not a, it's not a slam dunk. It's not a real easy thing to pull together, not for uh, the agency that's referring and not for SBA, because we ha have a lot of work that has to get done in a very short amount of time. 
Um, so we want to see the solicitation uh, copy of the offer submitted by the small business or a, and or an abstract of bids, a pre-award survey if that's been done, the contracting officer's written determination of non-responsibility, so you have to tell us why what was wrong and so forth. There's a, a lot of information that comes comes into the whole process. It is considered that the burden of proof on a COC uh, is vested in the small business. So they, they are actually the ones that, uh, you know, they have to participate in the determination. Uh, and what, what SBA does is, uh, while we're working with the agency to get the referral information in, we're also working for the small business, working with the small business to make sure that they are uh, also getting everything in that they have to, to bring into the, the picture. <clears throat> at the uh, a after the dust is cleared and everybody has sent in everything that needs to be done what happens at that point is there's a a meeting between uh, an SBA attorney that specializes in COC the COC specialist um, sometimes an accountant and uh, sometimes a supervisor um, the supervisor of the COC depending on how complicated the situation is um, and there, there's a, a vote and a decision is made as to whether the, the small business has the ability to perform the contract. At that point in time, SBA, usually the COC specialist, notifies the contracting officer and uh, in, in writing, so you, just so you have a heads up about what's coming your way. And uh, that's usually followed within a day or two by the paperwork. The effect of a COC is that it's conclusive as to responsibility. So if SBA issues a COC on behalf of a small business, and um, then, then a contracting officer has to award that. Um, they, there is an out, and that's covered by this next bullet. If anything, if anything else would happen with this award, let's say funding got retracted, uh, the requirement went away, um, a contracting officer doesn't have to award something in that case. So we try to be a little bit reasonable, if you will, relative to those requirements. <clears throat> the effect of a denial of a COC, if we find that in fact the small business isn't responsible also, then um, you, you have the option. You may either uh, go ahead and, and make the award if you want to, um, or you don't not necessarily have to do that. Um, the, the decision is on, is on you. Okay, relative to uh, the generic topics, let's talk about just kind of the catch-all section, if you will. <clears> there <throat> been some things that uh, have hit recently, and I, I added those to this uh, presentation. Um, first of all, there's a FAR case 2014-022 uh, that addresses the uh, adjustment of acquisition thresholds. Um, I will make that information available to Teresa and Shanta so they can get that out to you. It's, it is uh, kind of all-encompassing. There are probably 50 thresholds that are addressed, and I just hit the larger ones here, the ones I thought you would be most interested in. First of all, micro-purchase has gone to 3,500. As we told you earlier, the small business subcontracting plan threshold's going to 700,000. All this is effective on 10-1. Um, the commercial items uh, simplified acquisition threshold went from 6.5 million to 7 million. Um, the cost or pricing data requirement went from 700,000 to 750. And as I said, there are many more. So <clears throat> it's probably going to be very intense as you get all of that information integrated into your, um, your process and your information. But uh, you need to be aware of those. We still have a, a month or two to get ready. Um, this FAR case, 003, was published in the Federal Register just on 610. Uh, it, again, it's coming out of the Jobs Act. The comments are due on 810, so if you have an interest in this, you might want to uh, weigh in. Um, and this kind of changes, kind of, well, I think it closes uh, many gaps, if you will, 
um, about what to do if. So if the size of a prime contractor changes, let's say it goes a, a prime goes from a small business to a large business, sometimes that happens with an instant award, then a subcontracting plan uh, needs to be addressed when, when that happens. If a plan is, um, is required, let's say you have a $650,000 award, it's November of this year, and uh, there's a modification that increases that award to 725000 then at that point in time you have to uh, negotiate a, a small business subcontracting plan to make that happen. Um, we are uh, kind of tightening the belt a little bit with prime contractors to have them use NAICS. That hasn't always been the case. That was a surprise to me when I started doing uh, CMR reviews to find out that primes weren't doing that. Um, and as I said, we did a lot of educating uh, to make sure that they were ready for that. So uh, you need to be aware that that might not be happening and provide some guidance to your prime contractors. Um, here is the exception I mentioned earlier. A subcontractor now has the ability to address payment and utilization issues directly with the contracting officer and uh, that's not considered a breach of privity of contract. So it's just a provision that's in there that makes it a little bit fair, I think, for small businesses who might get in a bind with a prime contractor that's less than um, forthcoming or straight up. And so um, uh, just know that, that that might be a possibility in your future. Subcontracting reports that show up in the ERS, ESRS now uh, have to be corrected within 30 days. Uh, we talked about this. the next bullet, failure to comply in good faith efforts, uh, uh, now considered a material breach of contract, so that makes it more serious and subject to a lot of other ramifications, so be aware of that. Um, and I, I think this, I have some uh, uh, agencies that do franchise contracting operations. So they are scrambling to get their arms around this next bullet, and that is credit for awards under the Economy Act will vest in the funding agency, not the, reward, not the awarding agency. I don't think you, you uh, handle Economy Act procurements here, but uh, I think you do send some out uh, to be processed by other franchise organizations. So just know that, that the funding credit for that or the credit for those awards is going to come to you now and not to the agency that's doing the work. <clears throat> um, the next change, um, again, uh, we're looking for comments that are going to close on August the 3rd. Um, and it, it addresses several changes on the government-wide policy on consolidation and bundling requirements. And it's an extensive bit of information. I did not uh, provide a lot of uh, data on this, but just I wanted you to be aware that that conversation is going on. And if, you, if this is an area that you have an interest in, you might look at that. Okay, I participate, actually all PCRs participate every year in surveillance reviews. Um, I just led a team uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, every PCR gets, uh, that's just part of the rite of passage, if you will. It, it's one of the things that we do. And uh, it's a good process for us because uh, we get to see things that um, we don't necessarily see in just doing the uh, PCR reviews. So we get to delve a little bit uh, deeper into your business and make some recommendations on changes that we think would be would help your small business programs. So here's just some notes for the, from those uh, 2015 surveillance reviews. Um, one of the things that always shows up, when, especially when we interview procurement personnel, and that is, yes, we could use some more small business training. So that's almost always a finding, and I know that Teresa and Shanta uh, actually work very hard to to manage a, an aggressive training program um, uh, so that might not be applicable to you. Uh, market research, we find uh, market research to be missing. Uh, we find sometimes that there's no process or procedures on that. Uh, no comprehensive documents. Remember we mentioned that earlier, that's my new 
my new area that I'm, I'm going to be more comfortable with if we can get to the point where we have compre a, a comprehensive document. Um, an, another thing, uh, and this actually was applicable to the surveillance review that I was on, and that is the authority and placement of small business uh, specialists, small business staff. Uh, you, you know, we believe at SBA that, the, that, that those uh, people need to have as much autonomy as, as possible, so we don't like to see them integrated in contracting uh, activities. They, they actually need to kind of stand apart. So uh, on, on the report that I, I took care of, uh, that was one of the uh, findings. Now, in your case, uh, your small business specialists work for the um, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business, so you don't have that problem. Aren't you glad that wasn't from yours? Um, SBA has been promoting the use of social media just as a means to advertise small business opportunities, so we always look at that area to see how you're doing. Um, in the area of subcontracting plans, we found low and unsupported goals. Uh, we found plans, oh no, that hadn't been reviewed by the SBA PCR, um, plans that had not been given to us, uh, and no process for reviewing the reports, so kind of a whole uh, mixed bag of things. And, and we're always, we, and we always comment on the quality control that an office uses to make sure that uh, all, every, all the steps are being addressed, all the forms are handled correctly, determinations are made, everything makes sense. So we almost always comment on that. So I, I just uh, leave you with those full, uh, few bullets just to make you aware that uh, in your future, not this year, but maybe next or the next, uh, there will be a surveillance team coming to uh, look at you and they're likely to be looking at these areas. So that is, concludes my presentation. I think we're ready for some questions, Teresa. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you, Barbara. As always, extremely helpful. Good. So thank you so much. Good. And um, it's also good to hear what's coming down the pipe. So yes. thank you for that. And so while we pull up the questions, let me just ask on the comments that you just made, those are primarily general comments from the surveillance reviews or for HHS specifically? No, uh, it, that was about three or four surveillance reviews that I could get my hands on. Oh, okay, but, but not HHS. That's right. That's okay. Right. Not, okay. Not HHS specific. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so here's a question that we get all the time, and that is, will we get the slides? And the slides are to, if you're looking at your screen, the slides are to the right of the screen. So you can just um, open them up and save them from there. And if you're not able to do so, just email lynda.waters at hhs.gov or sbmail at hhs.gov and we'll certainly make sure that you get them. All right, so here's a question. Uh, okay, same question. All right. So question on the subcontracting plan. All right. I'm currently in the process of awarding a pain consortium contract to a university that only has video production services as their other direct cost, and that will be done in-house. They'll have zero goals. And they have zero goals. What do you suggest the contractor should include in its justification on why small businesses can't be integrated? Okay, so I'll go ahead and let you start and I'll tell you how I feel about that because I, I think the law and the regs are very clear that even that all subcontracting plans need to have goals. So what's your take on it from SBA's perspective? Well, in this case where it doesn't sound like there's any opportunity, and that happens, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding those uh, two clauses that I showed you earlier that yeah. said even primes have to, um, have to um, make sure that small businesses have maximum practicable opportunity. Yes. But I, I know that sometimes it doesn't happen. And in, uh -huh. in that case, where there isn't any opportunity, mm -hmm. then the plan needs to be waived. Now, 
you know, the magic is that it's going to take a level above the contracting officer to make that decision. So it should not be done lightly. It's, it's you know, the, we, think, we think that the check and balance is, is built into the requirement to have somebody, somebody higher than the contracting officer to look at it. Okay. So, okay. and that happens. It, do, it doesn't happen a lot, but mm -hmm. it happens sometimes. Okay. So, so in essence, if that does happen, they have to get that higher level review mm -hmm. and then document the, um, the uh, contract folder, Correct. contract file. So, okay, mm -hmm. very good. So someone wants to know, does a, line, a large prime offer include universities? Yes. The answer is yes. All right, and universities are tough, and and let me just say that uh, I think it's okay for you when you're dealing with your universities to say to them, you need to get some training on this because mm -hmm. they're resisting, and you know they have they have some responsibility here to be working with small businesses. Mm -hmm. So um, you know if 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 that's something that we need to participate in we're happy to do that thank you the the two CMRs in this area are excellent they do great training and I work with them a lot uh, so we're we're happy to help you I have presentations that I can make available to you Fantastic. I have the small business the SBLO handbook mm -hmm. just a lot of tools are out there to bring uh, universities up to speed to assist our contracting officers because we at HHS do a lot of work with the yes. university so I think that's important and I think it's a cultural shift that, I do that you're you're looking for here yeah and uh, one of the things that I told Teresa before we started the presentation is um, my experience is that um, as contracting officers and I, I really appreciate this I think that you you really are starting to see that uh, you know we have we have tools and we have responsibilities and kind of a very distinct mission and um, at, at SBA, and we want to work with you to make it happen. So when we when I talk about a cultural shift, that's actually what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And it's you know it's gonna it's gonna be slow, but it has to happen, and somebody's got to open the door to get these universities going. Absolutely. So okay, very good. So next question: Can you go over the seven hundred thousand dollar? subcontracting requirement effective one October they said they missed what you said okay that what what happens on 10-1 subject to that FAR case is that the subcontracting plan um, uh, threshold just goes to, from 650,000 to uh, 700,000 mm -hmm. so if you have a contract for 683 you don't have to be looking at a subcontracting plan mm -hmm. well that's gonna help especially since contracts are getting larger and larger so that's going to help a lot about every five years SBA or somebody on the FAR council looks at those and there's mm -hmm. always a big shuffle okay thank you Barbara very good all right after a small business is initially determined to be a hub zone what steps does SBA take to ensure that it remains qualified as a hub zone after the initial determination well, I will tell you that as an agency, that uh, that is monitored. And the reason I know that, it's usually monitored at the regional level, down to district offices, mm -hmm. and personnel are tasked with going out to uh, and, and reviewing sites and companies and making sure that they really are hub zone mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. And I, I spend some time with uh, business opportunity specialists in two, dis yes. two di district offices. So I have been, I have been on some of those shakedowns. Oh, you have? Yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and how was it? Well, uh, the last one I went on, there were signs, nice small uh, signs for this small business. Uh -huh. uh, we went in, there was no furniture. There was a pile of mail oh, in, no. in the middle of the floor, um, so that small that hub zone small business isn't. It's no longer <laughs> in the, the program. So, and those kind of reviews are, I think they're doing like um, in, in West Virginia they do like thirty a year. I might yeah. be overstating that. But. Yeah. 
They're, they don't take it lightly. So SBA not only has those site visits and reviews, but they also have recertification as well, is my Correct. understanding. Mm -hmm. So so SBA is truly monitoring them. And also the Hub Zone community monitors one another as well, police one another as well. So that's always well, a I, big help. I say small businesses really are the best. They do, they do the best job of self-policing. Yeah. It's wonderful. I think so too. So does the, next question, does the $150,000 threshold apply to GSA task orders? We get that question all the time. Well, and, and what I say <laughs> is it goes, the, the requirements, and I think what you're asking for is, it, is it a PCR review? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, and it actually goes to what the annual plan of operation requires. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is for for the year, okay. uh, and I, I don't think it's at 150000 I think it's at a higher level. I think it's um, maybe a million. <laughs> well, the one thing that we do, though, is we do require that all actions over 25000 are entered into the small business review system. And then based on the plan of ops, we then forward it to the, uh, the PCR. Yes. So. And, and one of the things that I've done is in those, I, I review anything that I see in SBRS uh, just because it's easier just to review it and get it going yeah. than to question it and say, oh, this really isn't my job. Yeah, to review. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so I, I just try to lump it all together and get things going as fast as I can. Okay. Very good. So next question, do Ebola related urgent and compelling overseas requirements in West Africa need subcontracting plans? And that is not, that is one of those, it depends. Mm -hmm. And what it depends on is if there's any portion of the work that's being performed in the U.S. So if it's, if it's all, if everything is being performed overseas, then um, probably not. Mm -hmm. and, and that happens. Well, not for now. My understanding is SBA is now requiring the um, the overseas contracts to be considered in the base for small business consideration. And so I think that change is coming soon. So the answer is not now, <laughs> but stay tuned. Well, that wasn't in my research. So I'm yeah. having, I, I learned something today yeah, too. Yeah, huh. yeah, that's been a major um, uh, bone of contention with some of the agencies that do primarily uh, overseas contracting. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have I haven't run into it with my agencies, but in the surveillance reviews mm -hmm. with like state and and uh, interior, the interior, yeah, the, I I ha we ran across that, and and so I had the opportunity to get into the research a bit, and and found out that if if a company is based here, performing some of the work here, mm -hmm. then there has to be a subcontracting plan. Yeah. Okay, very good. Next question. Can you talk about best practices for large firms to demonstrate attempts to locate small firms? Part two is, do you consider a search in DSBS as adequate? Well, you know, and that's a, that is a full-blown market research. Uh, question you know what first of all what are you doing strategically or what are they doing strategically to find out what what's in the market and are they attending your your vendor days mm -hmm. are they uh, coming are they going to uh, the big networking conferences mm -hmm. I think all of that stuff is important and and I support a few of those myself and participate with in the planning of them and I, I do it with a sincere um, understanding that we're actually looking for opportunities for mm -hmm. small businesses. Mm -hmm. not, it is not, you know, just a, a show that we put on. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I do on mine is follow back to make sure, you know, did you find anybody? Did you yeah. find anybody that time? So I, I think that uh, you, you know, you have to be looking at the heart of the prime and one, I, I gave a talk recently to prime contractors and um, I challenged them to be, 
as optimistic in actually finding small businesses to work with mm -hmm. as small businesses are optimistic in finding them. Oh, that's a great way to put that. Because a lot of times I look at market research and or subcontracting plans, mm -hmm. and it's apparent to me that there's this just little closed mind about small business. I mean, it, it just blares at me. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to see. So um, I almost always, uh, and it's always reflected in the goals. So it, it, it it's just kind of tells the whole tale. That's so right. I would just encourage your prime contractors to... Uh, open their minds and their hearts a little bit and then find these uh, businesses that mm -hmm. are just so hungry to to be uh, part of the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and when the large businesses or other than small businesses, when they submit their annual reports or semi-annual reports, they're required to provide an explanation on what process they use to conduct their market research for small businesses. And you as the contracting officer, when you review those, you need to ensure that they have done their due diligence. There are quite a few who don't. Mm. And uh, But I have to tell you that at a lot of our events, we have 15 to 20 large primes of our major primes that come out and um, you know and they support the small business programs and many of them also host their own small business events so to me if they're making that effort then that is is enough and this takes more than just going into Sam and saying okay I can't find any right, right. so okay or DSBS yeah, so investigate their hearts absolutely <laughs> I like the way you put that all right so next question in what this is related to changes coming up in what context can subcontractors address payment and utilization issues directly with the contracting officer that that would happen when um when a prime when when a prime was not paying a sub and they could come to you then then you could get involved in that and you know find out, try to get to the bottom of it, and involve SBA if you have to. I've, I've worked a couple of cases like that. Um, and as far as utilization, that, that addresses whether, you know, if they negotiate a, a contract with a small business uh, to be part of a, a larger deal and it's a $250,000 contract and it ends up being a $50,000 contract, then that, you know, I, I would think that you would want to be checking that out as well. And that's really what the Jobs Act was after in that Section 1321. Mm -hmm. it, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have dealt with the heartbreak of small businesses for years yes. who get rolled into these big actions and never see a dollar from yes. them. You know, they hire, they prepare, they do, they do clearances, they jump through every hoop there is, and nothing ever comes of it. That's right. And that's what the JOBS Act was designed to stop. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, what has typically happened in the past, well, for some, some subs have contacted the small business office, and we have assisted as well Good. with um, intervening between the prime and the federal government. So I actually think it's a good thing. So we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. the, I think the true purpose of that, the new requirement is to encourage prime contractors to do the right thing. Right. So, right. okay, fantastic. Are there any other questions? While Barbara is here, she's traveled all the way from West Virginia to assist us and to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. So I got, have received several questions again on, on how to get your training certificate. So again, at the end of this webinar, you will receive a questionnaire. Within the next 24 hours, you'll get a questionnaire. And just customer satisfaction to give us an opportunity to improve the service that we're providing to you. Once you complete that survey, then you will get a copy of your certificate. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So, any other questions? Ooh, that was way too easy. <laughs> that means you did a great job. Oh, I hope so. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. And if you have additional questions, please go, please email us at sbmail at hhs.gov. 
Thank you. Thanks.